Special guest in conversation this week, he's a polymath. I say that because he is, because he does lots and lots and lots of different things. He writes, he does screenplay, he does children's books. He's a fascinating man, and he's got the latest Bond book out. I think, actually, Anthony Horowitz, I think there are two Bond books, aren't there? Are there two people who have Bond books out at I, the moment? I, I, you've got me there, Steve. I'm, let me work that out. There's Trick or Mortis, which is mine. Yes. And there's Spectre, which is not a book, but a film coming That's the out film the coming next out. month. Uh, what is the other book? There was another book that came out, which was also a fantasy Bond book. And I think it was by, by William Boyd. Oh, that but that William Boyd solo. That was, that the was last, solo. I'm, I'm number four in line. There was Sebastian <laughs> Fawkes with Devil May Care. Then there was Jeffrey Deaver with Carte Blanche. Then there was William Boyd, I think, two or three years ago with Solo. Yeah. And then there's Trigger Mortis with me. So, which is, which I, is the I, current one. those other books, you are quite right, of course. Those other books, I'm sure, are still available in shops. But, um, yes. but, uh, but those, those are, I am the new one. You are the latest one. Actually, you got a fantastic review yesterday in the paper. In fact, you, you've had nothing but good reviews, which is I always... i had a lot of good reviews. Which is good fantastic. for authors. Well, you know, you never really know. You write the best book you can, and even up until the day of publication, you just sort of live in hope. How, how are people going to take it? How are people going to enjoy it? But you're right. I, I, so far, so good. Yes, and that's and that's what you don't necessarily write for that. But when you do get the plaudits and you do get people saying nice things about you, that kind of spurs you on. Well, I, when I was a younger writer, I used to go out, you know, chasing into newspapers to see what they were saying. Now I just wait for the publishers to send me the reviews and the knowledge that they'll only send me the good ones. Do you read so, them? Um, yes, I do actually. Yes, I mean, when, especially if they're a good review, I read them. I tend, to, I do tend to avoid the bad ones because the funny thing is, no matter how many books you've written, no matter how successful you are, or how confident, or even how arrogant you are, bad reviews still hurt it's human nature you know if somebody yes. says that you know your book is slow or boring or wrong or this or that you know it, it doesn't matter you don't think to yourself you know what an idiot how can they say this thing? you say to yourself oh dear what have I done wrong at least that's for me I mean maybe other writers are different yes. but I tend not to now to chase reviews and and uh, as I say I just wait for the ones that turn up that, I think because nice. you are successful you know a lukewarm review wouldn't make too much difference to you because you've got the success you've got the track record I'm always thinking so much not so much of myself and uh, you know of course it is personal but it's also you know the publishers and the booksellers there are lots of people who own the li- you know who earn a living from a book yes. not just the writer yes. and I always feel a certain responsibility for everybody else too and not to mention incidentally in this case a responsibility to Bond fans who don't want to have their hero mucked yes. up and to the Bond estate the family of Ian Fleming who commissioned me in the first place you know I want to do as good a job as possible for them and 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 therefore Look, they, they've given me the thumbs up and their approbation is really what counts above and beyond the critics. But it is all part of the same parcel. So we still have Pussy Galore. How wonderful it was to be able to bring back Pussy Galore for Trigger Mortis. It was just... I, I've I met suggested her. It I've to, met her. I, I won't ask. Uh, you, are you talking about Honor Blackman? Or yes. You, how yes. wonderful for you. Oh, I she's mean, just wonderful. Uh, she was brilliant in the film. Although I have to say that in the book I'm thinking more about the Pussy Galore that Ian Fleming wrote. And little yes. things are different. Like yes. not having that wonderful blonde hair. The original Pussy Galore has black hair. So, yes. you know, people might be a little bit surprised. But she is one of the great icons of the series. And when I suggested to the estate that I bring her back there were a few raised eyebrows at first was this a good idea but I thought it was a fantastic thing to do nobody ever asks what happens to these girls after the final scene you know in every single film we see Bond in bed with somebody but by the next film they're just a memory yes. uh, so you know what would it be like living with with Bond and of course no spoiler here it doesn't go that well how many how many uh, Bond films were there that weren't written by Ian Fleming uh, of books well I think there are only 10 books but then they used an awful lot of titles Quantum of Solace, for yes. example, Octopussy, which were which weren't books. Octopussy is a collection of short stories for your eyes only. So they used all the titles, and then they used sort of other little bits and pieces. But um, I would have said more than half, probably even two thirds of the Bond films are now not really connected to the books. And even the ones like Moonraker, for example, is a very good example of a Bond film that had very very little connection with the original book. Yeah. Uh, it became a sort of a jaunt in outer space and a quite an enjoyable yes. film, but nothing to do with Moonraker, which is set in mainly in Cornwall actually yes uh, <laughs> I don't think people know this though I think you get people who are aficionados of Bond well, movies you get the and anoraks like in like me sitting here and you know Bond no, I don't mind an anorak huge, believe you me well I mean since I was eight years old Bond, oh have you, you know, well even the Alex Ryder books all my children's books the Alex Ryder series was entirely inspired by James Bond you know I tried to get the job of writing a film and when they wouldn't let me I said well you know okay then I'll do my own and Alex Ryder was born <laughs> but yeah, 
even his name. I mean, Alex Ryder in Doctor No, the, the Bond girl is Honey Child Ryder, yes. and she is sort of his spiritual mother, and that's where it all began. <laughs> so, how did the estate? Did the estate just think, "Oh, we'd like you to do this," and they approached you, or was it? Is this a lengthy process? Well, it was lengthy for me. I mean, it lasted about thirty years before they approached right. me. But what happened was, I mean, they first they started with Sebastian Fuchs, who had a very great success with Devil May Care, and they kept on. I was then getting more and more envious watching these other writers stepping in and doing, and, and I was thinking, "Well, why can't I do it?" And I occasionally get little newspaper articles to write diaries and things like that, or interviews. And I just was mentioning here and there, I'd love to do a Bond novel if they asked. And and eventually they did. Eventually, an email came in. I was invited to lunch in a little tiny restaurant in Soho, down in the basement there. Very James Bond, I thought. Very sort of you know clandestine cloak and dagger lunch, where I was sort of looked over and asked, you know, would I be interested? Then I had to go in and meet the family, which is quite a daunting affair. They have this huge building in Haymarket, a little bit like the headquarters of Spectre. And uh, I went in and met the family who actually were charming and nice and very pleasant and relaxed and it was a nice chat and at the end of that I got the note yes you, you're, you're hired off you go and it's been you know just a, it's been a joy ever since I mean it has been a pleasure to write the book and it's been a pleasure to work with them and for me it's a childhood dream to be writing James Bond mm. you you have been so successful you're another one of my guests who I when I read through people's thing and I think you're another one who went to boarding school yes. this seems to be a, a theme running they, they, they did a lovely piece in the in the Daily Mail saying about kids who went to boarding school and how mothers used to stand there with tears in their eyes waving off their, their children. Did you go at an early age? I think I was one with the tears in the eyes. You had the tears. When, when I waved goodbye to my mother, that's my memory of it. I went to a place when I was eight years old up in uh, North London, up on Harrow on the Hill. It was a horrible school. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. Really? I was once asked, you know, Steve, it was an interesting question. Would I swap all the suffering? I sometimes say that, you know, that the suffering and the unpleasantness of my boarding school fed my writing and sort of helped to make yes. me into a successful writer. And somebody said, well, would you have then swapped not going to that school and not being a writer and that's a very interesting question I'm not sure but I certainly wouldn't wish boarding school at that age on any child 8 to 13 is when you want to be with your family mm. with your parents at home in comfort and to this day I don't quite understand why when my parents knew how much I hated it sobbing every time a term came up and going on crash diets because I was quite a chubby child mm. so four days before school I'm suddenly saying I won't eat I won't <laughs> eat it's pathetic really uh, and all the sort of self-loathing the beating the 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 violence, the sort of the, the cruelty, the bullet, all of it. I don't understand why they put me through it. No. Um, uh, but they did, and, and, and I survived it. But what helped me was books, reading books, discovering books when I was 10 years old, the school library, and every year, the James Bond films. They were fantastic. <laughs> you know, they really were my, my doorway. They were yeah. the escape line. And, and I would be f sitting in class fantasizing about being James Bond. Oh, you were a daydreaming boy. Of course. You stared out of the window. See, I went at nine. And were you happy? Well, I was lured there under false pretenses. My parents were in the forces, and I think you got a discount if you were in the forces. Oh, you're no, there. And so are they many went. There. Look, you went the same. Him, and, yes. and, and, I, and I went there, and my parents were living in Yorkshire at the time. My father worked for a missile tracking station. Mm. It's all a bit James Bondish, Indeed, actually, really. Yes. It's, a bit, it's one of these secret stations. And so I was 400 miles away at nine years old with a mattress about an inch thick, bedwetting, a tuck box, deeply unhappy only farmed out at the end of term back to my parents but at the half term exiats you got farmed out to other parents oh, and they were to look too. after That's you right. and I don't think it, small small classes you learn to read you learn to sort of almost be very self-sufficient I've always discovered that, that kids who go to boarding school can actually hold a conversation with adults when you're about 10 or 12 years old That's right you learn very very quickly you learn that fast confidence. That's what the main thing that comes out of private schooling yeah. is absolute confidence and learning to fend for yourself and to stand your ground and everything Other thing about boys who go to boarding school is they eat very quickly. I don't even notice yes. that, but they all eat. Well, you're worried it's going to disappear. Fast. There wasn't very much of it. That's right. You ate as quickly as possible. I think I had a diet, diet of haddock every morning. <laughs> I used to hate haddock. I, uh, I came to loathe haddock. My hatred was porridge. We had oh, to really? eat porridge. You had to finish the bowl as well, and it made me feel quite sick. Sounds like Oliver day. Twist, your place. Oh, it was worse. I think Oliver Twist had a good time compared but to But you're the, right, though. You place. do develop a very furtive imagination. You do start fantasizing. You, you can take yourself away from a situation. We did get the cane. I can remember on numerous occasions. I don't know why, actually. I mean, but my mother hated it. She said, 
on her deathbed, she said, I wish we'd never sent you to, to boarding school. Well, my parents died very young, and I was never Mine really too. able to have the conversation with them about why they had done it. But I think I do know, because when I was growing up, my father would have thought, my father being a sort of a Jewish immigrant to this country, mm. or his parents had been the first generation to come to Britain, I think he probably thought that this was always sort of the uh, stiff upper lip, cold showers, good for you, it'll turn you into an English gentleman sort of thing. And I'm sure he thought it was for the best. I mean, you know, he wasn't a cruel man, but he just didn't have an understanding. And these days, of course, it's interesting to think that what teachers did to you and to me back then is now illegal. They would go to yes. prison if they did yes. it. And, and yet we put up with it because it was what we were told. I mean, the beatings at our school, the thing always was the person who had the blood that ran furthest down their leg won. And we, as little children, thought that was sort of all right. But it wasn't. It People used to say, show us the marks on your bottom. Oh, always. You'd have well, to show them back, how many wheel down. marks right. did you have. That's the other thing as well. That's it. And whether two wheel marks went over each other, which, yes. of course, was even more painful. It's very interesting. I don't consider myself to be old. But when I talk to someone like you about education <laughs> and about the experiences I went, I feel antediluvian because no child listening to this now would be able to recognise what we're talking no. about in any modern school. And thank goodness for that. Yeah. It is extraordinary how much has changed in our lifetime, but nothing more extraordinary than the way we were educated. We had cold showers. We would come back from playing rugby and you'd have a cold shower and then you couldn't do your buttons up because your fingers were so cold and you'd have to get other boys whose fingers had warmed up on the radiators to try and do your buttons up. I mean, it was that archaic. Uh, the you, school's still actually, there. It sounds like the Yorkshire sketch out of Monty Python. You actually got water in your showers? <laughs> yes, go cool, I tell you, luxury, luxury. Listen, very quick break. Uh, more from Anthony Horowitz after this. Special guest in conversation. I love talking about boarding schools because everybody's got the same experience. We've all, I think that formed the, the people that we are. And that's why uh, Anthony Horowitz, he's not here to talk about boarding schools. He's here to talk about uh, Trigger Mortis, which is getting some fantastic reviews. I mean, seriously, people are, people are loving your work. But then people have loved your work for years. You seem to sort of move quite effortlessly. Children's books, television scripts. You know, James, everything moves quite nicely for you. I've it's, it's a very thought, fortunate life. I've always thought of writing as being an adventure. Yeah. You, the, you know, the point of writing is not to make money, it's not to sell product, it is to have adventures, to travel through the world of every type of writing. Dare I mention, I even have a play opening in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, uh, of course you can. another type of uh, writing, which is sort of a major, major challenge to actually try and write a play in the theatre. But for me, you know, sitting behind a desk with a pen and a piece of paper, it is... It is. It could also easily become something that is arduous. That is just something you do for the paycheck at the end of the month. I don't want it to be that. And I love the way I can, you know, do a children's book now or a film, or to go, you know, suddenly to be doing a James Bond book or to have done yes. Sherlock Holmes. Yes. You know, it's all about mixing it up. So who do you admire then? Who are the people that you look to? Do you, do you look to people now for guidance? I don't look to people for guidance. I mean, I admire my sons very much because I admire them because they're starting out and, they're, and, I, and I look at many, many young people today. I mean, uh, another thing I'm doing is a TV show about the Y generation, about this next generation of young people who are coming up. And I do admire how many, many young people are doing fantastic work and, and are working so hard to make careers for themselves in what are extremely difficult circumstances yes. now, getting a job getting a property, getting somewhere to live in London, which is almost impossible yes. these days for young people. And so when I look at my son and, and, and his circle and his friends, and I look at what they're doing, and I look at their optimism and their cheerfulness and their energy, they're the ones I admire. So I yes. suppose I'm looking to, to younger people rather than to older now. But they get that from you because you're a, you're a very positive person, you know, as a role model. You're absolutely ideal. I should imagine you're as enthusiastic about, you know, what, what your children do as, as to what you do. I try to be. I mean, I think, you know, when I was growing up, my parents were not my father in particular didn't think that I would ever be a writer he thought that was a ridiculous thing yes. to want to be and slightly ridiculed the idea I mean you know be a businessman be a lawyer be a doctor but a writer really and and he did rather put me down and I swore when I became a parent but I would never do the same as that I sound like I'm bad mathing my father was a very good man in many mm. many ways but he had sort of these very strange sort of blinkered corners of his perception uh, but in terms of my children you know what makes me so happy and I think this is again we were talking earlier about boarding school when we were growing up there was this huge gulf between us and the generation above us you know I would never my son calls me Tony now if I had oh, called just my father oh, by his oh, first no. name if my father <laughs> if I had called my father by his first name he would have had a heart attack yes. he would have just simply been out of the my father too nobody in Sydney ever calls me Tony uh, I'm Anthony but my son for some reason has decided I'm Tone And but to see I love it I love the fact that I can sit at a table with these young people and be yes I know I'm 30 years older than them but at the same time I, I, I don't feel that there's a great gulf between us you know in writing a book 
like trigger mortis even i like to think that the alex Ryder readers are still with me and they were all still part of the same family so um so that I, I, to me is one of the nicest things about the age in which i live is the sense that i'm not grandpa with a cardigan and a walking stick in the corner not yet. Not yet. yet. I was going to say, not yet. Yeah. You are like a children's film foundation film in yourself. You really are. You're sort of living the dream of the excitement, of the enthusiasm, of sort of creating the characters and putting it all together, and then and then sitting down. This this relationship you have with the children. It's you. As I say, my father would have been horrified. I, I wouldn't even have dreamt of calling him by his Christian name. Well, that's right. I, well, I would have well, thought I mean, it was no, disrespectful, actually. No, but that's what I. You see, I hate being called Mr. Horowitz by anybody because when I'm oh. called Mr. Horowitz, I think, well, no, that's my father. That's not me. I'm Anthony. And so I really don't like it. I've, I've already told my children that when the, when the time comes, we're not having the G word. They can, right. my, their children can never call me grandpa or granddad oh, no, or no, anything no, with G. No. They can call me Anthony or they can call me sir if they want to be respectful. <laughs> Nothing else. <laughs> you went to rugby. I did go to rugby. Well, I was much happier, actually. I went yes. to rugby when I was 13. And here's the thing, you know, Steve. The real thing about education is this. In education, we talk about schools and education and free schools and academies. What we need to talk about is teachers. A good teacher, one good teacher, can make such a huge difference yes. in your life. And when I went to rugby, I had not one but three English teachers wow. who found the writer in me and who encouraged me to to enjoy drama. One of them, to, a, to a, the other was literature, and the other one was all about grammar and language and punctuation and all the rest of it. But they just enthused me and excited me about language. And you said very kindly that I seem to be a sort of an energetic and passionate person. But the thing is that I was inspired by these three people when I was 13 years old, and I have never forgotten it, and it's still with me today that language and writing and, and books and the world in which I inhabit is such a wonderful world to be with so many great writers out there to enjoy. Uh, but it began at, at, at rugby school, you're right, yes. The interesting thing, of course, rugby was the basis for Tom Brown's school days. Uh, yes, that's right. Um, Tom Brown's school days. I love the Fleshman novels, incidentally, yes. by George yeah, Bernard Fraser, which, I, which <laughs> I've too. always enjoyed and which my sons have now read as well, yeah. which is quite nice to pass on. You know, it's another great thing about literature is passing on your favourite books to, to your kids and, yes. and trying to get your family to read together, which, of course, you know, I've been very sort of strong about in everything I talk about but uh yes tom brown's school days it wasn't quite as bad as that at rugby when i was there I think that we would... just phased out fagging actually when i was there had um, you i think i i was a fag to an older boy which wasn't an un... i know s s using that word these days it's sort of nobody will even understand what you're talking about well you know, <laughs> so, you know white, cleaning another boy's shoes and all yes. that sort of making his toast and all that sort of stuff uh but that was phased out while i was there and the school was already modernizing and i went back to rugby a few months months ago yes and now of course it's a co-educational co yes. school which i think is very very important I would never have sent my children to an all boys school. Um, you know, they have so much to learn from girls. You know, that don't don't separate them from the better half of our. You've population. got that to look forward to, have you? Uh, what <laughs> relationships with the, with the children are there? And no, well, my children have already got relationships, right. and, and, and uh, you know, I love meeting their 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 other halves. That's that's great as well. You know, when suddenly there's an extra person at the breakfast table, I think, oh, that's you nice. like this, don't you? I can I tell you do, like I this. The whole, you know, I I wasn't great at I wasn't crazy about parenthood at the early, you know, the nappy stages and the Pram, pram stages and the plastic toy stages and all that sort of stuff. But now that I've got these young men hanging around the house and now you can friends, talk to them and now that we're having chats and discussions and my younger son is a political journalist so we have long political rows together and I love all that and then, you know we are a very very close family and, yeah. and you know when I, I know I talk more about my books and my literature than anything else but actually my first love is probably my family are you a religious person no I'm not religion was sort of knocked out of me I was sent to Sunday school I'm Jewish and I was sent to Sunday school when I was 11 and by 11 and a half I was both um, I, I was a total anti uh, 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 atheist i mean completely right. anti-religion in every in every way it's kind of uh, kind of put you off did it? i was it was, pudgy and i was teased by the girls and i yeah. couldn't understand it i mean hebrew is is was complicated yes. all these stories it meant nothing to me at all the only two letters i was ever able to learn were s and sh and that's because they look like a w uh, but there's a dot underneath it i forget which way it is now but uh, <laughs> that's the only letter you don't keep a kosher household absolutely not my children uh, were actually christened baptized because my wife is not jewish and, right. uh, and i wanted them to have every option open to them i do think religion is important i mean i'm not anti-religion particularly I think the people who have religion have something very valuable I think if you can have a life where you have a sort of a, a moral framework uh, which is what religion in its essence provides uh, that's a, that is largely a good thing but do I believe in God do I believe in an afterlife no oh nothing at all no but I believe in life 
Yes. I believe in, in, in using your time on the planet to do what you can for other people, to help people, to entertain people, to try and contribute and to make the world a tiny bit better than where, the way you found it when you came in. That, to me, is what religion should all be about. It's not about going onto your knees. It's not about singing. It's not about sort of rosaries or crucifixes or any vestments or any religion at all. It is just about being good to your fellow man. That's it. How do you feel, then, when, when you look at the papers every day and you see some of the horrors that unfold around the world? Does it make you feel sad? Yes, it does. And of course, there is now a sort of a corrupted form of religion, which is doing great, great harm. I mean, you know, these, as I say, I have great respect for every single religion in this world, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, of course, you know, in their essence, the teachings that they have are a moral framework, which we do need, we cannot live our life without in just the way we want to live it in some kind of anarchy. Religion is a way is a guiding principle. But when it is subverted, and when people do horrible things, in the name of religion, and it isn't instantly always just Islam, that this is the case for i mean you know in the jewish religion and the christian religion there have been things done which one looks back on with great sort of dismay and which still happen nowadays uh people take points of view which they think they can uh, get away with because they are you know are couched in religious terms that's not always true mm. so yes i do in answer to your question yes i do get sad you're a very blessed person, aren't you? Really, you seem to have. All, I, I get, the, I get the feeling you're not very good at relaxing. I, I get do the, relax. Actually. Do, can, I relax. Can you manage family, to take I yourself like to down? Read. I like to read at night. I like to watch. You know, I was, I was, before I came into the studio, I was having a discussion about all oh, the wonderful television there is at the moment. I'm, I'm into the Good Wife at the moment, and that's oh, a wonderful I, relaxation. <laughs> and there's hundreds of episodes of it to get through. <laughs> Life is too short for the amount of good TV there is. Can at the you moment. take holiday? Do you do holiday? I tend to work on holiday, but I. Uh, but you can right. tell I have a tan at the moment, and I've just come back from Greece. I hardly I go to noticed. Greece a lot, and uh, it's the lighting in the it's studio. It's the lighting. It's the lighting here, but uh, I go to Greece a lot, and I, I try right. to relax there. Yes. Excellent. Well, listen. Well, good luck with everything you do, because there's obviously sort of things that were around in your mind, which which keep you going. Well, it's fun. I'm having I'm having fun, especially with my writing. Yes. Excellent. Listen. Uh, good. I don't need to say good luck for uh, for Trigger Mortis, Anthony Horowitz. Thank you very much. Thank you image that I brought back from Sierra Leone just to get back to that for a second. You know, these little kids, eight, nine years old, they run away from home because the family can't feed them. They go foraging and then suddenly they stay overnight before you know where you are. They're runaways. And I met one little guy.